Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Wilson Center, those here uh, in person and those watching today's event on via uh, webcast. Uh, I'm Robert Litvak, uh, the Senior Vice President of the Wilson Center. On behalf of our President, uh, former Congresswoman Jane Harman, I welcome you to today's event, uh, which uh, is on a timely and important topic. Uh, um, we are conducting today's event in partnership uh, with uh, the Alcano Royal Institute. We're, we're delighted to again work with them on this event. Uh, we had co-sponsored an event in 2015 on transatlantic cooperation on terrorism, uh, the keynote address of, for which was given uh, by the King. And that was a special occasion here. And there is a photo outside this room, I believe, that it kind of uh, memorializes uh, that occasion. Uh, today's topic, um, uh, as I say on the TV law shows, is ripped from today's headlines. Um, uh, it's the Catalan crisis, uh, implications for Spain and beyond. Uh, Catalonia's unconstitutional October referendum and its subsequent unilateral declaration of independence brought the secessionist cause uh, into the international spotlight. Uh, fast forward to today, when several members of the Catalan government await trial in Spain and the fate of former regional president Carl Puigdemont uh, currently in Belgium remains uncertain. Uh, how did this extraordinary chain of events come about? Uh, will the upcoming Catalan regional election lead to further conflict, or is a peaceful negotiated outcome still possible? And what are the implications for Spain, for the European Union, and for secessionist movements ar around the world? Uh, I said that this is a timely and important topic. It's, it's important because Spain is a critical country in the European Union partner in NATO, uh, and there are, so there are stakes for this uh, crisis, the outcome of this crisis for the United States, uh, and hence we're delighted to host today's uh, panel uh, in conjunction with the Alcano Royal Institute that reflects a diversity of perspectives on, on the Catalan crisis, and we're delighted this distinguished uh, panel, <coughs> distinguished, <coughs> distinguished panelists could join us today. Uh, I'll, there were bios um, distributed, but let me briefly introduce um, our four speakers. And the format for today is that each will ha uh, have a, uh, an opportunity for 10 minutes or so to make an opening statement, then there'll be some discussion amongst ourselves, and then open it up uh, to, to the audience. Um, our first speaker uh, will be Bonnie Field. She's a professor of global studies at uh, Bentley University. Uh, Bonnie has, uh, Field has a doctorate in political science from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her research in interests um, center on political parties and political institutions in transnational and uh, institutionalized democracies in Europe and Latin America. She investigates minority governments, parliamentary regimes, inter-party relations in, in parliament, processes of candidate selection, political appointments, and the like. She has a book, Why Minority Governments Work, multi-level multi territorial politics in Spain. I'll introduce each of the, of, uh, of the speakers as we turn to them, but we'll open with Bonnie Field. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for, for coming today and to the Wilson Center and also the Elcano Institute for, for organizing this event. I want to say a few words about um, the proximate causes of the rise in independent sentiment in Catalonia and then a bit about the current state of affairs both in Catalonia and more broadly in Spain, and a bit about my concerns about where the, the crisis has um, brought us and or where it's, it's leading us. Um, so let me focus for a minute on why I think cat support for Catalan independence has, has increased in recent years. Uh, I view the, this increasing um, pro-independent sentiment or pro-sovereignty, the, the right to decide on the future of Catalonia as beginning approximately 2010. So I'm going to focus on explaining these, these changes since, since 2010. On the one hand, I think it, it has much to do with deep public disenchantment with politics and the political class in Spain. And I think this is, is true of, of Catalonia itself, but it's also true of Spain more broadly. This is related to the deep economic crisis that hit Spain after 2009, um, also the implementation of painful austerity measures um, and, and, the, and, the, and 
problems associated with, with the, the implementation of those measures. It also has to do with a series of corruption scandals that have hit um, the political system in Spain, both at the national level and at, at the regional level. Um, we've had scandals involving the popular party. We've had in, at the national level and in regions like Valencia, we've had um, corruption scandals involving um, the former Convergence and Union Party in Catalonia or um, the Socialist Party in Andalusia. So there's a, a sense that there's something wrong in Spain and a disenchantment with Catalonian politics, with Spanish and Catalan politics. Um, that is generalizable to the whole of Spain. Uh, and we've seen the political consequences of that. We've seen um, in recent years widespread protests, the, the 15, the, what's called the Quince M movement or the indignant movement that, that came about in Spain. We've seen the rise of new political parties like uh, Podemos, We Can, or um, Citizens. Um, and the, really the transformation of the Spanish party system as a whole that led to difficulties of government formation in, in Spain in 2015 and 2016. So I think there's a, a generalized uh, discontent in, in Spain, but there's also specific grievances in Catalonia. And I think we have to add to those, those grievances the um, 2010 Supreme uh, Constitutional Court ruling on Catalonia's statute of autonomy, which declared aspects of that um, reform unconstitutional. So you had a specific grievance also that was um, targeted um, in Catalonia. And I think this gave um, pro-independence and pro-sovereignty movements and parties a audience, um, a bigger audience that was willing to um, perhaps uh, accept a, um, a willingness to change the status quo. Okay, so on the one hand, I think that the, the deep public disenchantment is, is part of the story here. I think the other part, there is certainly a degree of political strategy on the part of, of um, political parties to heighten tension in, on, on the territorial issue, both in Spain and in Catalonia. So the main two dimensions of uh, political competition in Spain are territorial issues, um, uh, also related to national identity, but then also socioeconomic left-right issues. So there was an incentive in the context of this disenchantment and this, these austerity measures to kind of change the story, change the message, and focus on these kind of territorial identity issues. And I think that that helped both um, both Catalan nationalists that could um, uh, emphasize um, Catalan grievances, but then also um, the Spanish central government that could play um, kind of a defender of, of Spain and of, of Spanish national identity in the context of this growing disenchantment, sort of what we might call in the United States kind of a rally around the flag type strategy. Um, there's also an element of, of party competition. You have the political parties in Catalonia that have consider themselves to be Nash Catalan nationalists competing for who is going to be the lead nationalist party in Catalonia. And this has led to um, competition for um, what, what to offer Catalan citizens is with regard to Catalan grievances. I think the third um, part of, of this is also the the differences between those that were in power, particularly after 2011, with the popular party that won a, a major election victory in, in 2011 with an absolute majority and also had, had previously won um, great victories at the regional level. So it was a, a time when the, the popular party was very strong um, with little incentives really to negotiate um, over Catalan grievances. And it's the party that's sort of the, the more conservative and the more kind of centralist um, political party in, in the Spanish party system facing um, the nationalists, the Catalan nationalist parties um, in, in the, at the regional level in, in Catalonia. And I think that the, 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 the lack of sort of the need or the desire on the part of the national government to negotiate with the Catalans, but then also the, the Pepe government, the popular party government serves as a good, um, an, easy uh, an easy type of government to criticize from the perspective of the Catalan nationalists because of the distance between their political positions. So it, it serves as a rallying force for um, Catalan nationalists. And then I just want to mention one other thing that I think is important as far as proximate causes of this change um, that is, um, I think, underemphasized, which is, I think, the very skilled Catalan independence movement, particularly led by the Catalan National Assembly and um, Omnium Cultural, which 
which I think um, has done, you know, regardless of um, different political views on the on the substantive question, which has done an amazing job of mobilizing pro-independence and pro-sovereignty sentiment in Catalonia. Um, so there's just some of the sort of proximate, very kind of Spain um, yeah. focused causes of, of rising independent sentiment. So where did this um, lead us? I, my strong view, and I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on this, is that the ground in Catalonia has really shifted. That um, we don't have the, the, the slide up here, but um, public opinion around the question of what Catalonia's relationship <coughs> should be with Spain has dramatically changed um, in the post-2010 period. So depending on the question you ask, if you give um, Catalans a, a four option question, um, about 40% say that they want independence. This is up from the low, low to mid-teens in the pre-2010 um, period. Um, about a quarter of them want a federal Spain, um, and about another quarter want the, the status quo. If you ask a yes or no question on, on independence, it usually in, in, in most all polls, it comes out to be just a little bit short of 50% of Catalans say that they would want Catalonia to be an independent state. Um, so in, in part, we have to recognize that, that Catalans themselves are, are divided. It's not a universal sentiment in favor of, of independence, but that there's been a dramatic increase in a, uh, a large plurality, if not a um, close to a majority of Catalans that, that want independence. And I personally don't think that this is um, a temporary uh, outcome. Um, and I think the upcoming elections are just confirming what has have been the trends of the last several years. So I think that in thinking about political solutions to the current crisis, um, I don't think just hoping that this is going to go away is going to be is productive in finding in finding a solution. So definitely Catalans themselves are divided. But I would also like to say that this is not just a, an internal Catalonia problem. I think views of Catalans are often quite different from the views that are expressed in the rest of Spain, from things like whether or not a referendum should be held. Um, more Catalans <coughs> support the holding of a referendum on independence than those in the rest of Spain. Um, many Catalans, even if they don't want independence, are unsatisfied with the level of Catalan autonomy. There were big differences in public opinion on the basis of the Spanish government's suspension or limitation of uh, Catalan autonomy, much more support in the rest of Spain than had existed in Catalonia. So there is this, this I believe, very um, important difference between public sentiment in Catalonia versus public sentiment in the, in the rest of Spain. And I think this helps us understand a bit that the party's political strategies, when they're speaking to their base, the, the political strategies on all parts are to um, to, to play to their bases, right? That's, that's, that's where their electoral success is going to come from. It's not, the party politics on the ground is not one that lends itself towards easy compromises. Um, so there's differences be, between Catalonia and Spain, but there's also differences between sort of being a, a, one of the Catalan independence parties in, in your voting base versus the popular party or citizens and, and their electoral be bases. So um, it makes for political solutions to this problem very challenging. But my concern is, and this I'll, I'll end with this, and, and I can elaborate more hopefully in a, a second round, my concern is that if we keep the status quo, which is not finding a political solution to the, the underlying problem, that it's going to contribute to the degradation of political institutions in Catalonia and Spain. What we're already seeing is um, public discourse um, <laughs> being quite, the tone of public discourse being quite, um, quite negative, um, accusations of, of authoritarianism are, are thrown around um, quite, quite frequently. Belief in political, different political institutions often depends on your partisan um, identification or your view on the, the, the territorial question. And so my concern is that if we don't find a, a, a solution to this underlying problem, that that will continue and potentially undermine shared institutions in, in Spain and Catalonia. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bonnie. Um, our next speaker is Jaime Mallet, uh, who is chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Spain. Uh, uh, he is um, uh, a distinguished economist, uh, lawyer, and business leader. He served as chairman of uh, the American Chamber uh, in, in of Commerce in Spain for nearly 16 years, just was reelected. Um, and uh, the, the chamber consists of a membership of more than 300 companies, including the majority of, of major U.S. companies with a presence in Spain. Um, in his capacity, he works to improve uh, the business climate and strengthen trade relations between the two countries. He's also responsible for attracting and retaining Spanish investment in the United States and protecting the interests of American companies in Spain. Thank you I mean. very much. Good morning to everyone. <coughs> Special thanks to uh, both Wilson Center and um, El Cano Institute for inviting me to join <coughs> this morning's panel. As with all situations of um, this scale, the th circumstances in Catalonia can certainly be analyzed from a wide array of perspectives. In my case, I could uh, surely analyze it as a citizen, in particular as Catalan. Although I find myself living on planes and trains, Catalonia is the place I call home, and uh, I am a purebred Catalan. I was born and raised in Barcelona to Catalan parents, Catalan grandparents, and great-great-great-grandparents. Catalonia is where I have raised my children, and where I live with my wife when I am not traveling. But the reason I have been asked to be here with you today is to offer my vision as a chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Spain. We have been one of the principal voices warning of the possible risks of the Catalan independence movement. During these last four years, we have made an effort to speak loudly and clearly on the detrimental business effects of the actions be being taken by political nationalist leaders who have div driven us to the current situation. A situation in which the regional Catalan government, <coughs> with a parliamentary representation of less than 35% of the total electorate, have meticulously prepared during years a secessionist process, organized a fake illegal referendum the 1st of October, and finally proclaimed the new republic the 27th and at the same time trying to implement a parallel legal framework disrespecting both the rule of law and the judicial authority. A scenario which has led to a situation of massive business uncertainty, all while causing deep and bitter divisions in families and friends. This but few of the collateral damage born out of the impossible dream of some. A fictional narrative, a massive post-truth with fake reasons and fake consequences, funded by taxpayer money, which portrays the Spanish state as an old-fashioned, lazy and corrupt repressor, always robbing Catalan people. However, the truth is that Spain is a democratic nation with quality institutions and separation of powers. Spain is the 14th largest economy in the world, with a nominal GDP roughly equal to that of Russia, and a GDP per capita larger than that of our neighbor, Italy, which with a growth of 3% GDP during the last two years has shown strong resilience after a tough financial crisis. The country boasts one of the best quality of life indexes in the world, with top tier infrastructure and healthcare systems. For example, we have been the worldwide leader in organ transplants the last 25 years, and one of the <coughs> one of the top three global tourist destinations with France and the US attracting over 65 million tourists every year, uh, what is a lot for a country of 46 million inhabitants. Certainly, Spain, like all countries, has room for improvement in many aspects, but by no means does fact justify the actions taken by the Catalan government. A government which through its statue of autonomy has one of the highest levels of surf rule in Europe, managing its own parliament, all health care, all the education system, as well as, as, well as over 300,000 public servants, including its own police force, and a much loss making public broadcasting. 40 years ago, in 1978, over 90%, 90% of Catalans voted in favor of the Spanish Constitution, 
one of the most modern, open, and decentralized constitutions in the world. Despite this fact, the Catalan government has taken their people down a dangerous path, a path which has led to, after a crazy process, a unilateral declaration of independence without any international support. This has been achieved through the implementation of an extensive, massive propaganda campaign, mobilizing Catalans with allegations of economic suffering and false hopes for the future. This campaign in media and social media, with the help of foreign actors like Russia, R Russia and Julian Assange and, and others, promised people widespread international recognition and massive investments from corporations. According to some sources, over the past three years, more than uh, uh, two billion euros have been used in propaganda. At least 97 million per year have been allocated to open embassies and pay international PR firms with the aim of giving global visibility to the independence mo movement. Only to see that not a single country, not even Venezuela or North Korea, has spoken out in favor of the recent illegal referendum and declaration of independence. Instead, what has happened is that companies based in the region have left, preferring half their legal and tax headquarters registered in other parts of the country. To date, in, te in only 10 weeks, nearly 3,000 companies have left the region. Amongst them, 15 out of the 20 largest companies in Catalonia, many of them members of Amcham Spain. The two Catalan banks, one of them one of the largest institutions in Spain, the country's largest toll operator, the largest hotel chain, and the Catalan Water Utility Company, only to name a few examples, um, which are all members of the institution I chair. One out of three, one out of three companies with more than 50 employees have left the region and billions of euros from savers have been transferred as well from current accounts in Barcelona to accounts in other parts of Spain. These 3,000 companies have not abandoned their roots because of a real possibility of independence, and this is important to understand, something which has never existed, but instead, because of institutional uncertainty, a very real fear of double <coughs> taxation and laws not being respected by those in power, as, as the members of the regional government have constantly stated. For a long time, the central Spanish government's strategy was that of permissive policies towards clear cessationist plans. Despite our warnings from uh, Amcham Spain, a very few people in Madrid or even in Barcelona thought this situation would go so far. However, Last October 27th, after the proclamation of the new republic, the Spanish government was forced to apply Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution. This article revokes the power of a regional government which does not comply with the law. It has been applied for the first time since 1978 and as a temporary measure up until the regional elections called by the Spanish government for the 21st of December, that is, <coughs> this coming Thursday. Catalonia is one of the most prosperous regions in Spain, with an extremely high quality of life. The climate is outstanding, and there are not, not earthquakes, hurricanes, snowstorms, or other natural disasters. In addition, everything is extremely clean and very safe. Spain is one of the safest countries in the world. There were only 295 murders last year in all Spain, less than a medium city in the US. As in the rest of Spain, Catalonia enjoys high standards of living, totally free health care, and free public schools and partially free universities for all of its citizens. Spain is the second country in the world with longest life expectancy, and Catalonia is one of the regions leading the, the ranking. Even the food is excellent. <laughs> Additionally, as mentioned, the region has a high level of self-government and democracy. When nationalist political leaders in the regional power during most of the last 40 years say Spain does not allow referendums of independence because it is not a real democracy, they are simply lying. In fact, in the past five years, there have been two regional elections, plus another one this week, 
three general elections, two municipal elections, and two elections for the European Parle Parliament, and also two illegal referendums paid by uh, taxpayers' money. Out of the 350 representatives in the Spanish Congress, 47 are Catalan, the <coughs> second region after Andalusia represented at the Congress. Unfortunately, due to the massive propaganda campaign, instead of seeing everything that the region has to offer, victimism and complaints have done nothing but to increase. Luckily, these complaints have not go gone further than the massive demonstrations driven by active grassroots organizations and the regional government itself, of which you have seen photos uh, in the papers. It is, it is difficult for a real bloody revolution to be born in a place where people truly live so well. In sum, a big shame and a damage for the image of such a peaceful part of the world with terrible consequences for business and families. So what we need now? We at the MCHAM believe that uh, what we need is new politicians to channel everything Catalonia has to offer in something positive. We would like Barcelona and the rest of the region focus on innovation and attraction of talent. The American Chamber of Commerce in Spain is an apolitical, bipartisan entity. We work to attract and retain investments and improve competitiveness. And during my long leadership of the Chamber, we have worked well with right and left, with Bush, W, Obama, and Trump administrations, with Aznar, Zapatero, and Rajoy, with Republicans and Democrats, with Partido Popular and with the Socialist Party, with the unions and the bankers, with nationalist governments in the Canary Islands or in the Basque Country. We have worked very well indeed with previous nationalist governments in Catalonia itself. But whatever it happens in the elections on Thursday, we are going to be, as to date, loudly and tough against political actions, especially impossible ones, which may represent any substantial risk to the minimum legal and institutional stability so much needed by our members to invest, general wealth, and create employment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, <coughs> Professor Joseph Colomer. He's an economist and political scientist currently affiliated with Georgetown University and the Barcelona School of Economics. He's the author or editor of 25 books have been published in five languages on democratization, forms of government, voting systems, European politics, and international institutions. He was a founding member of the Spanish Political Science Association. He's a life member of the American Political Science Association and a member by election of the Academy of Europe. Uh, Joseph. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you to the organizers, the Wilson, the Wilson Center and the Instituto Alcano, uh, all of you for coming. Um, mm, my summary is that the Catalan crisis is just one element of the Spanish crisis, both in the short term and the long term. And the short term has been well explained, and we can discuss some specifics later on. So I'm going to focus on the long term crisis and structural elements that can help explain the current situation. Mm, and basically, the first idea is that the conflict comes from the fact that Spain has failed in building a robust national state. That's a historical fact. And Catalonia, you know, like Catalonia, like the Basque Country and parts of the population in many other territories in Spain have not, never been completely assimilated into the Castilian dominated patterns. So in national conflicts, um, basic political science, there are three basic alternatives. So one is, um, one unit becomes dominant and assimilates the others to its patterns. The best example, of course, is France to build a successful national state. A second possibility is that there is some arrangement or settlement, typically in federal terms, to stay together, keeping the differences, but also the union. Best examples could be the United States. Or three, there is a split and secession, and there are many cases, as you know, so from Ireland, from Great Britain, to many others in recent disintegrations of modern parts and larger states. <laughs> well, the point is that none of these formulas have worked well in Spain regarding Catalonia. And my view is that it's not going to work either, because uh, Catalonia has been, and it's doomed in Spain, 
just to make it simple, I hope you can understand, basically due to its relative mid-size, which is about uh, one-sixth of the Spanish population and about one-fifth of the economy. Which means, in my view, that it's, Catalonia is neither sufficiently large to lead Spain, to be the leader or the dominant pattern, nor sufficiently small to be left on its own by the central Spain, as it is the case, for instance, for smaller communities like the Basque Country, that you can discuss if you want. So let me elaborate. For the first formula, Catalonia has never been sufficiently large to lead Spain. Well, if you know a little about it, so you know that many Catalans have always seen themselves as more prosperous, clever, and entrepreneurial than most Spaniards, and so thus capable of leading them. But the political initiative from Catalonia towards Spain mainly developed in the 19th century, at the time of the partly frustrated industrial revolution, uh, because it was more successful in Catalonia and the Basque Country than in the rest of Spain. And at that time, in political terms, you can draw a parallel with mm, the leading role of the Piedmont in the unification of Italy. So because both Catalonia and the Piedmont were peripheral northern regions, industrial regions within their peninsulas, trying to modernize a backward, mostly agrarian country, at some moment both through a liberal monarchy. And actually, the last time a Catalan was the prime minister of Spain was by then, about 150 years ago, the last time, uh, General Joan Prim, who led the pronunciamiento, uh, military pronunciamiento, became prime minister and hired and imported a prince from Piedmont, precisely, to be elected king of Spain by the Spanish parliament. But the operation was a big failure. Uh, Prim was shot to death the day after the king was elected, and the new king, the new king uh, abdicated and went back to it Italy very soon. So uh, basically this was the main moment, the, the best moment. So regarding the first formula, leading Spain, you can say Catalonia was a frustrated Piedmont. Never got to be successful in leading the modernization of the whole Spain, the full Spain. Then, the second formula, which means arrangements or settlements of a federal-like type, there have been at least four important attempts in the last 150 years. I will be brief. Uh, the first was an attempt at making the first Spanish Republic a federal one in the 1870s. And also there were two Catalan presidents of the Federal Republic of Spain at that time, but only for a total of six months between the two, among the two and the Republic was overthrown by a, by a military coup d'etat. The second attempt was the establishment of a commonwealth or mancomunitat of the four provincial councils of Catalonia about 100 years ago, 1914, which lasted for nine years only until a new military coup d'etat disbanded it. The third attempt was the Spanish Second Republic in the 1930s, which approved a regional statute of autonomy or regional constitution for Catalonia. But this um, already anticipated all, some of the current uh, conflict features. So it was preceded and followed by two proclamations of a Catalan Republic, unilateral declarations, of course. And uh, if you read the proclamations, they were done within a Spanish federation or even a Iberian federation. But as neither another region of Spain imitated such a unilateral declaration, or even the constitution, the Republic uh, and constitution was not federal. So in practice, those proclamations were declarations of secession as well. Well, as you may know, uh, the Second Republic lasted for only a few years, and the Catalan autonomy for four years, plus two in civil war, before a long military dictatorship. So then finally, after this long, tragic history, we arrived to the current Spanish democracy, which uh, included autonomy for Catalonia since 1977 in provisional terms, and then more formally uh, with a regional constitution or statute since 1980 and elections, etc. So this has lasted much longer than any previous experience. But I 
don't agree completely with uh, the characterization that my colleague has said about Spanish democracy. Actually, there is a low level of institutionalization in the Spanish democratic regime. Uh, no interinstitutional cooperation, rather permanent inter-party and inter-territorial competition. We can elaborate more on this if you want, but eventually this has led to a movement for independence. And now, now as you know, the autonomy is suspended. The Spanish central government rules directly over Catalonia. So my point is, Catalonia is not sufficiently small for the Castilian dominated Spain to let it on its own or to negotiate the path to her self-determination in contrast to the Basque country or other experiences in many other places. Why so? Because the loss for Spain would be so be too big in economic terms, etc. And for this reason, we can discuss this. I think that the Spanish central rulers will never be willing to permit to Catalonia the very high levels of self-government that they have accepted, for instance, for the Basque country, or even less a referendum about it. <coughs> so all in all, the political relations between Catalonia and the Spanish state has been cycling, like a carousel, trying to lead Spain, settling on regional autonomy within Spain, seeking independence several times, each alternative during the last 150 years. As everything has failed, it has been a repeated story of frustration. Frustration means that you expect to get something and you never get it up completely, or as much as you expect it. I think this succession of cycles has fed among many Catalans the feeling that the trials and failures are going to be permanent, that the Catalan problem in Spain cannot be solved, that it has been and will be perpetual. And the interesting point is that for many Sp Spaniards too, there is no solution. Let me uh, go back a little uh, away, but uh, the idea of conllevancia, which according to this, which now is again on the table, right, uh, in the common conversation. So according to the Spanish dictionary, the word means to get along well, to muddle through, but also to endure something adverse or painful, something that you have to live with, okay? But you would prefer not to. Uh, this was uh, popularized, this expression conllevancia was popularized by the uh, Castilian philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset uh, <clears throat> during the 1930s uh, about the Catalan question, but in a way that I think is still very valid and has been revi revived recently. I'm quoting Ortega y Gasset with the belief that the Catalan problem cannot be solved, it has always been before the peninsular unity existed, and it will remain as long as Spain will subsist. End of the quote. And so this is a Castilian point of view, which is, has spread widely, even more recently. And this view implies that neither Castile-dominated Spain would ever be able to assimilate the Catalans, as the French did, for instance, with the French Catalans, right? Which are not many, much Catalans anymore, are French, basically. Spanish didn't get this point, nor will ever recognize Catalonia's self-determination. So the only possibility is to try to attain short-term arrangements to kick the can down the road, to ir tirando, as you say in Spanish. <clears throat> Let me finish with, uh, so far, with another very recent testimony, which uh, probably you can appreciate, which was the president of Catalonia, Carles Puigdemont, when he announced the call of the referendum for independence a few months ago, he predicted, I'm quoting, between commas, although they, they meaning the Spanish government, of course, want to see us, the Catalans, meaning the Catalans, beaten or defeated, in the end, we will be defeated soldiers of an invincible cause. I love this expression defeated soldiers of an invincible cause, which means we'll be a defeated, defeated, defeated again and again. So the conflict will last forever and dure and dure. So my forecast in the mid and long term is a double defeat of both the Spanish state, which will resist, of course, as is proven, but will not be able to prevent being dismantled within the European Union and the world of global interdependence, and a defeat of the Catalan project, which will be unable to create a new state. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, final speaker. Um, 
Miguel Orte Ortero uh, Iglesias, who's a senior analyst uh, at the Real Instituto uh, Elcano. Uh, um, he's a research associate the, at the EU Asia Institute uh, in the School of Management in France, ESA. Uh, previously, he was an assistant professor in international political economy uh, in Paris, uh, an adjunct lecturer at Queen Elizabeth House within uh, Oxford University, done postdoctoral research at, uh, uh, at, at LSE, uh, was at Oxford, um, and uh, uh, he co-chairs the a political economy section of, uh, of EUSA. Uh, he writes on, on uh, a host of issues at, at Del Cano, and, and we'll get his perspective on the current Catalan crisis now. Thank you. <coughs> Hi everyone, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks as well to the Wilson Center and um, Del Cano to, um, to decide that I should uh, represent here the Del Cano's view, although some of them are, are my views on, on the Catalan question. I, I'm going to divide in you know, how we got here, um, the shock after the 1st of October, mm. and then mm, the way forward. And just a couple of things, adding to what uh, already my colleagues just said. Um, and giving it a bit of more of an international European perspective. Um, I think the first uh, thing to say is that it's sad to say, but somehow we had to go through this. Um, you see, the idea of being able to create a new state that will be more liberal for liberals, more socialist for socialists, a more communitarian and anarchist for anarchists. It's a very powerful idea. You have a blank sheet, you fill it with whatever you want to fill it with. Um, and so in many ways, I mean, since I'm small, we had this Catalan question, the Basque question. And so when the crisis struck in 2008, 9, 10, when um, a lot was contested, when disenchantment was big, as Bonnie explained, then the utopia of leaders telling their people, we're going to go through a desert, but after our journey, there will be an oasis there for us waiting. It's very powerful. And so we, un unfortunately, we had to get to the edge. And, uh, you know, I feel for Jaime Malet and a lot of uh, you know, um, uh, business people in Catalonia and Spain, because of course they would never like to see that. But politics is how it is. And so, uh, yeah, we had to go all the way to the edge and we, we arrived to the edge, to a unilateral declaration of independence and what all this meant for, for the state of emergency that we had to go through in, in, in October in, in Spain. But I think a, a couple of other aspects are important. There have been uh, people working, um, and among them, for example, Oscar Martinez Tapia, that have analyzed the programs of the Nationalist Party in Catalonia, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we, we have surveys in Spain on what are the biggest preoccupations of people over the years, over the past 30 years. And you see how the desire for independence is very strongly in the programs, in the, you know, in the party programs before the elections. But the preoccupation of people for independence is very low. There's no demand, really, for independence. People don't see it as one of the big problems, like unemployment, like you know, the institutional framework, like corruption, like other aspects. But you know, it's easier for politicians to, to speak to this very primary instinct of identity and independence. And this has been used uh, in Catalonia. Another aspect I think we should bear in mind is you see relative growth and relative decline. Catalonia, as, as Josep uh, just explained, has always been the vanguard, always been the, the most modern and richer, one of the richest regions in Spain. But if you look at uh, the figures of per capita income between 1980 in 2016, between Catalonia and Madrid, for example, you see that the gap is increasing. The capita income in Madrid is higher and higher vis-a-vis -vis Catalonia. And this creates a lot of frustration in Catalonia. And the feeling is, 
In today's European Union, if you are not a member state, you don't count. And how can it be that the Slovenians, and all due respect to the Slovenians, the Slovaks, the Maltese, the Lithuanians, are at the table, and we Catalans, that have been always modern, advanced, rich, are not at the table. Because Madrid is at the table, Spain is at the table. So the feeling is, we don't count, we don't have power, and therefore we are missing out. The way to overcome that is we create our own state, we become a member state of the European Union, and so we can be at the table in the European Council and in the European Central Bank, for example. Right? So these are very powerful forces that I think we should, we should look at. Um, on the shock of the 1st of October, when the referendum happened, and there were a lot of images about police violence, etc., that really shocked a lot of people outside and, of course, inside Spain. And <coughs> then this internationalized the conflict and this put us all on edge. I mean, I remember, I guess, a lot of the people here at the table as well, but I remember, you know, the first 15 days of October, I hardly slept. Most Spaniards were in the same situation. I would say the great majority of Catalans were in the same situation. Uh, so this was a, a, a great um, state of a, a, a emergency and exception. But I think we cannot understand the 1st of October without understanding what happened in the Parliament of Catalonia the 6th and 7th of September, when the, 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 um, the, the laws for the referendum and succession were passed. Were passed by a small majority, uh, a tiny majority. As you know, the independentists, they had a majority in the Catalan Parliament, but they didn't, ha they didn't have the majority of votes because the, 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 the voting system in, 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 in Spain um, you know, gives more weight to the uh, votes in the rural areas of Catalonia. So, uh, uh, you know, a um, member of parliament uh, in Barcelona, in the province of Barcelona, is much more expensive than in the other provinces of Catalonia. So that means that essentially you, you can have a majority in the parliament, but you don't have the majority of votes, okay? And with this tiny majority, they passed through, they rammed through this referendum and succession laws, which is very disturbing because, you know, one difference between the Anglo-Saxon world and the continental European world is for very big things because of our past, because of our history, for very big things and big changes in our constitution order, we normally need qualified majorities. In most of our constitutions, this is enshrined. You need at least, in many ways, two thirds. If you want to change the constitutional order, you need two thirds of the parliament. If you want to change the statute of governance of Catalonia, you need two thirds. As a matter of fact, if you want to change the director of the public television of Catalonia, you need two thirds, two. But suddenly, you know, the Catalan leaders, they decided that with a simple majority, it would be enough to go for independence. And you see why that is not very democratic in my view, right? And that happened before, before the 1st of October. By the way, stopping the referendum of the 1st of October was not called by the Spanish government. It was called by the Spanish judiciary. It was judges that said, look, this referendum is illegal and should not happen. Then we can discuss whether you know the police actions were proportionate or not. But I think context is important to 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 um, to bring in. And the Catalanists, independentists, they thought they would have a lot of European and international support after the first of October. They really thought. I think a lot of them really believed that they could actually maybe create a, Spani uh, sorry, a Catalan state that would be still in the European Union, would still use the euro. Uh, and, and you know, things would be much smoother than they were, right? Although for years we told them, look, the European Union will never support any of your unilateral actions. Never, because of many different reasons. Because you go against some of the principles, the key principles of the European Union. One, the integrity of states, of member states. And two, the acceptance and you know, following of the rule of law. If you don't respect the rule of law and the European Union is based on the Kim Communitaire, on the rule of law, 
been preaching that to all corners of the world in all our agreements all around, that you know you cannot really go against that. Right? So so no support, and that I think was a surprise for many of them, and, uh, and that created a lot of frustration. And there's no surprise now to see that if you look at surveys, uh, a lot of the Catalanists not the Catalans, the Catalans are less European right now than the majority of Spaniards. Right. Spanish in general are more pro-EU than uh, a lot of the Catalans. And this of course created the counter movement. Right? I think it was a surprise for a lot of them that not only didn't they have support <coughs> outside, but they created this mobilization of Spanish feeling people in Catalonia. People, the so-called silence majority, came out, the 8th of October was a massive, w more than one million people on the streets of Barcelona with Spanish flags. That was very surprising for a lot of them. And now Ciudadanos, a country that, uh, sorry, a party that didn't even exist uh, uh, 10 years ago, is possibly the most voted party in Catalonia on Thursday. I mean, this is a, I mean, uh, Boni was talking about, uh, about sea changes and systemic you know, movements. If, if that, and seismic movements, if that, if that is then happening, you have woken up a lot of people that, one, they feel that they have not been protected by the Spanish state over the years. There was not enough presence of the Spanish state, coming back to what uh, 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 Josep just said about, you know, well, you know, the Spanish state still needing to be more robust in many aspects and more present. Um, but as well that a lot of people really, you know, they don't really want to go through this because a lot of people that are from migrant families, they used not to vote for Catalan elections because they didn't feel really represented by the Catalan institutions. But they now feel Catalan, Spanish Catalan, and now for the first time they might be voting on, on Thursday. So you created now a more, I think, um, better map of the reality of Catalonia. And the reality of Catalonia, it's a divided society. It's a almost 45, 45. It's a divided society. And therefore, and looking now forward, is a referendum the best way to solve the problem when you have a divided society? A referendum that is maybe 50 plus one? We go back to the, to the culture in continental Europe that simple majorities don't do the trick. And so a referendum, and we had, as, as uh, Jaime was saying, we had a lot of elections. You know, people could express what they want over the past years. And what we see is that the independentists got a ceiling, the uh, uh, anti-independentists or, 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 or you know, pro-Spaniards, they now are mobilizing, they will get as well to 40, 45. And therefore a referendum will not solve the issue. It will create winners and losers, and we <coughs> have to get away from this type of narrative the winners and the losers. Um, so what to do? My last minute. As was said by, by Josep, I think the most important aspect is how to deal with the frustration of not being able to have an oasis after the journey through the desert. How to deal with that? And how to balance it of not giving rewards for those that went against the constitutional order which is the other side, right? Why would they have better fiscal conditions? Why would they have even more autonomy? What would they, why, would they, why would they get rewarded <coughs> for going against the constitutional order? And so, I mean, our feeling, I think that's shared in our institute, um, is essentially, you know, I think we need more Spain in Catalonia. Uh, and if, for example, uh, a municipality takes away the Spanish and the Catalan flag and puts the independentist flag there, to, you know, to, to, the state cannot just watch how this is happening. They have to actually you know, uh, make their presence felt there, that there are red lines that cannot be crossed. Um, more understanding as well. I'm a Galician. I speak Galician at home. Uh, I think Spain is a multi-ethnic, multi-identity country, and so a more federal spirit would be welcome. That means more respect, perhaps, even symbolic gestures. The Senate of Spain should be really this you know, upper chamber similar to the Bundesrat, where you know, regions can actually have their say, where there's more co-decision, co-governance. It cannot only be that Madrid decides things. In many ways, you, know, you have to have the regions involved in, in the decision making, more and more with European issues <coughs> as well. 
Um, but as well, more engagement of the Catalans in the rest of Spain, right? Uh, <coughs> I think there's a big gap. Sometimes I'm surprised that I don't see so many Catalans in my, in my field, in other fields, that, you know, I think sometimes you can see that a lot of the Catalan elites as well, they struggle to understand how Madrid, how Spain works. And there is as well a democracy on this side, right? I mean, there's a democracy in Catalonia, but there's a democracy on this side. And so far, I don't see any democratic mandate for any Spanish government to you know, negotiate a referendum with, with the Catalan. You know, there's no mandate for that. There's a, there's a very strong democratic you know, view that, that no, that uh, you know, we, should, we should stay together, right? And that, that should be as well uh, accepted for, by a lot of the, ca um, the Catalan elites. Finally, I think we need to as well to avoid to have the Quebec effect. The Quebec effect meaning that slowly companies will leave Catalonia, that Catalonia will cease to be the engine of growth of Spain, always having growth <coughs> rates that are higher than the average, to having growth rates that are less than the average, because more and more companies will go to other parts of Spain, less investment will be in Catalonia, and this is what happened in Canada in the 1990s, where Montreal, because of the secessionist movement, lost out and Toronto won. And I think that uh, should be avoided because that will be creating even more frustration in Catalonia. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miguel. In your comments, you kind of gave us a, uh, uh, a s your sense of uh, the stalemate that may emerge from uh, the upcoming elections on uh, December 21st, but I'd be interested in the other panelists as kind of what, um, what do you see as the possible outcomes of, of, uh, the, um, of this election? I mean, <coughs> it w um, will it solve anything or just sort of be a, a kind of another uh, enter a new phase of, of kind of um, stalemate. <coughs> no, I'm not going to comment on survey polls, uh, electoral polls, because, you know, Hillary Clinton had 93% of probabilities to win the election 24 hours before the election. Brexit wouldn't happen. The referendum in Italy was going to succeed, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't know nothing. An election but 25% of, of, of Catalan uh, p people say that they don't know who yeah. are going to vote for. Mm. Okay, so we don't know. Anything may happen. Anything in the, I think, in my view, in this path of permanent instability, which is not going to solve anything. <coughs> because, I, so I, I would reframe, rephrase my point. So the, the crisis of Catalonia is partly a contribution to the crisis of Spain, but it's also a consequence of the crisis of Spain. <coughs> And uh, let me just uh, mention a few facts <coughs> to qualify some things that have been said here. Um, Spain has not recovered from the Great Recession. You talk about Madrid. You, uh, you said Madrid uh, has increased its gap <coughs> in the economy regarding Catalonia. No, Madrid has increased its gap regarding everything else in Spain. So Madrid is the only place which is economically successful extremely successful at the expense of everything else in Spain, of the rest of Spain. You go to Madrid, <coughs> which is typically the place you go, right? And then, oh, how wonderful it is. If I was born in Madrid and grew up in Madrid and never lived anywhere else, I would be like my, my people, my friends from Madrid, saying that's the best place in the world, of course. But you just go out from Madrid just a few miles and you see the disaster, okay? Spain has still a lower per capita GDP than 10 years ago, which is unique, except Greece, in Europe. So almost every other country in Europe recovered the previous levels of per capita GDP in four years. In four years. We'll see. This was the expectation last year, but now it's going down. It's slowing down again as the consequence of the political crisis, right? And it took in the best of the cases, would take 10 or 12 years, and it took four years in the average Europe, mm -hmm. okay? <coughs> and then, if you look, you say unemployment is bad. No, it's not true. If you look at the number of employees, which is what it counts, even for a higher population than 10 years ago, the number of employees in Spain is still much lower than it was 10 years ago, okay? And the political situation is in chaos, because two years ago, they needed the party system, the traditional party system was destroyed, and then they needed two elections in six months in order to have a government because the first attempt was a failure. And then now we have, Spaniards have, 
the smallest minority government ever, supported by only about one third of the popular vote. Okay, thank you. And, in, in the, and the People's Party in, in Spanish government has 8% of votes in Catalonia. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be less probably in a, in a couple of days. Do you think that the Spanish government can rule over Catalonia with 8% of votes for consensus or equations? That, that is not going to work. And okay. then, let me just finish. Opinion polls show that most people in Spain, most people by Lafar, feel very bad about the, everything, the state of the economy, the huge rates of unemployment, widespread corruption, which is going to exploit again against the Spanish government very soon, as soon as this Catalonia thing disappears from the front page, and the low quality, in particular, the low quality of politicians and political class. That's the, that's the, real, the real situation. Catalonia is partly as a consequence of the historical developments that I mentioned, the failure of Spain to build a unified nation, but also contributing factor to this crisis, which is the crisis of Spain. Thank you. I mean. I, 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 I do not agree, I'm sorry. I think that uh, Catalans are always looking uh, to the past, which is a terrible mistake. Uh, they are talking about <coughs> um, uh, a terrible date where Barcelona was uh, um, uh, tr uh, trying to be against the Bourbons and the, the, the king of Spain and, and, and the France is 1714, um, when Barcelona had only 35 thousand inhabitants you know they are talking about the village small village 300 years ago as it was today you know uh, the history of spain perhaps is not the best one but we are not talking about the past we are talking uh, about the present you? the future spain is part of the european union it's a very strong uh, uh, country has very uh, strong institutions and catalans are always complaining because during 40 years of democracy nationalists have been running the show uh, as a regime without letting anybody say anything against them. So um, mm, the difference between being uh, um, a nationalist or, or, or being uh, 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 a proud of, 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 of your country, a, patro a patriot, is that um, when you are a, a patriot, you are talking always well about mm, your country. When you are a nationalist, you are always talking bad about others. So that's, that's the, the reality. Um, I think that uh, whatever it happens uh, on Thursday, uh, things are not going to be, are going to be different for, for, for good. Um, they have, uh, uh, in, in the independence movement in Catalonia has been um, in, 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 Ca in Catalonia forever, for, for, for hundreds of years. Uh, many people thinking that um, it's better to be French, others uh, that it's better to be independent. Uh, during years and years and years, but what is clear is that they, they have been lying to the population that the territorial integrity of, uh, of the states that was uh, proclaimed at the um, uh, Peace of Westphalia in 1647 is not going to uh, be uh, um, a change in, in, a, in, a, in a western part of the world uh, like Catalonia. They have been lying about consequences, they have been lying about, about the, the, the reasons they have used uh, the uh, a very big propaganda m with the with the with the money of the, of the taxpayers, but this this is not going to be uh, uh, again like this. You have to take you have to understand why the Spanish government has been so permissive with uh, Catalonia during this not only these two years but during forty years. And the reason why is because um, the majority the parliamentary majorities in Spain. Uh, have always needed uh, uh, the Catalonia mm, nationalist movement uh, to um, to uh, get power in, in Spain. During these 40 years of democracy, almost 30 years have been ruled by socialists or by Partido Popular with the help of the nationalist, uh, um, uh, um, was called moderate, is no, no longer moderate party. Bonnie, briefly, and then we'll turn it over to the okay, very briefly. audience. Yeah. I, I think it's significant that in the coming elections, we are discussing whether or not the independence parties are going to win a majority. I think after what's happened in the last couple of months, that's very significant that they could return to winning a majority in parliament. 
And to me, that indicates that this is a problem that's not going to go away. People, you said this had to happen. People know the consequences, and yet they're still voting in very similar ways in the sort of split between those that are um, supporting independence parties versus non-independence parties. So um, that's neither good or bad, but I think it's, it's significant that people have not shifted their preferences substantially. So my, my hope, but I'm not very um, optimistic, my hope is that this would indicate to the the different, um, I think there's more than two sides. I think there's some sort of want more of the Spanish central state, like you said, and one that want an independent Catalan state. And I think there's some in the middle that want a new accommodation for Catalonia and Spain. So I don't think it's a 50-50 society. But I'm hoping that this, this election, if something good comes out of it, will be the realization that these are sort of, they've solidified, these, these, these positions have solidified and there needs to be some political solution. I think that the short term partisan um, incentives are not to find one, um, but I do worry that in not finding one, we're leading to greater polarization. Um, you all pointed out, you know, the the holding of a referendum and declaring independence on the basis of an unconstitutional referendum. But you know, we have we have politicians in jail. We have Catalonia being governed from Madrid by what Josep said, a party that won eight percent of the vote. Um, we have civil society leaders in jail. I mean, whether or not we agree with any one instance of these events, cumulatively, they are very negative for, um, I think, Spanish and Catalan democracy generally, but also for citizens' belief in the legitimacy of those institutions. Okay. Let's um, turn it over to the audience now, um, and we'll collect a couple of questions, let the, the, uh, the panel respond. I just would note, First, I wanted to acknowledge, you know, Charles Powell, who's the director of Elcano, delighted that he could be with us today. Thanks, Elcano. They provided uh, a packet of information, including some, some interesting polling data um, and background information on the, on the current Catalan crisis is available uh, for those here outside and uh, uh, on the Elcano website for those who are watching via webcast. So uh, comments and questions uh, from the floor. Um, we'll start with this. Woman, and there's a microphone there. Yeah. Uh, and you could, the speakers could identify themselves. Yeah, my name is Diana Negre Molino. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. There is something I'm missing here, uh, even from my fellow Catalans, and especially from Mr. Malet, whose children went to school in Barcelona, the role of education. I'd like if someone could elaborate on this, because <laughs> Um, many people have criticized the educational system in the sense that it has produced a lot of, of, of secessionism, and especially, probably, they may have a role because mainly the young people are the ones who want to secede because they went to, through this educational system. I was in America all the time, so <laughs> I like your opinion. Thank you. Uh, Ka Kent Hughes? Uh, Kent Hughes here at the Wilson Center. Uh, thinking about Scotland rather than Catalonia and the situation after World War I, four empires fell, a lot of countries emerged. Do you think the EU is faced with the reality that there's some leftover pieces of empire? Could be an independent Scotland, Wales might follow, maybe Catalonia. And once you have the EU, in terms of the economy, you don't really need a Spain or a France or an England. You're part of this much larger unit. So should the EU th rethink its position with regard to uh, continuing existing states? And the gentleman in the back, that'll, that'll be the first round there. Thank you very much. Ishan Darura, The Washington Post. Uh, I just uh, just to, to, to continue that question on the, the larger European map and, and how what's happening in Catalonia fits into the larger question of Europe. Um, it, it's been very confusing to me as a complete layman outside observer to try to square the, the nationalism we see elsewhere in Europe alongside the kind of uh, politics being mobilized by the Catalan nationalists. As they are very pro-Europe, they're very pro a kind of liberal view of the world that they at least espouse. And, uh, and in my interviews with Catalan leaders, that's, that's what I've taken away from it. Um, 
I, I was wondering, you know, especially when you have people like Martin Schulz in Germany declaring this idea of a United States of Europe, uh, could you just talk a bit about um, the larger picture and what's happening, what, what, happen what is happening in Catalonia uh, in terms of its effects on the European system? Yeah, I think that last question, last two questions really point to, I mean, uh, the issue is not high on the kind of the U.S. kind of foreign policy agenda. It should probably be higher. We're preoccupied with our own, the disruptions that our own society is going through, just as Brexit is one for the United Kingdom. But there was sort of this, and we've got a couple of political, uh, several political economists on the, on the panel, is like there was this notion that the European Union was going to sort of, as it were, solve the problem of nationalism in <coughs> Europe that had led to uh, two world wars and, 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 and that and the like, and had created enormous prosperity in Europe. Um, and uh, also, b because of the, the um, civil society provisions of the European, uh, European Union were, as it were, sort of finessing some of the problems of nationalism. So that, in, that the fact that both Ireland and the Euro United Kingdom were in uh, the European Union created a basis for kind of a workout on, on Ireland. And that resolution is now, you know, there's a question about it in light of the Brexit decision. So this is this uh, broader European context is, is one of, of, um, of interest here. So we'll start the panel. There are a couple of issues on the table. Why don't we just start down at sure. the end with Miguel. Yes, um, very telegraphic. Um, first point on, on um, Giuseppe's uh, point that Madrid is, um, is kind of, you know, um, doing better than the rest of Spain. I think this is, I mean, and all what you just said uh, are, you know, um, tendencies that we see in a lot of countries. Um, big metropolis are right now the winners of the process that we are experiencing. Uh, the technological disruption, the digital revolution we are experiencing right now makes, you know, big metropolis hubs of economic activity of talent, etc. So this is not only happening in Spain, it's happening in London, it's happening in Paris, it's happening in, you know, maybe perhaps Germany is the only place where you have a more decentralization. On and at Italy. the end of the day, visitors to Spain, they realize that you find a lot of other cities that are quite affluent, Valencia, Bilbao, even, you know, my place, La Coruña, these are places that are not and, you know, again, this might be a bit controversial, but this is not the hinterlands of the UK, for example, where you have, you know, certain cities that are run off much more than in Spain. So I think we should, I mean, and, and the whole notion of inequality, I think, you know, Spain is one of the most unequal societies. This is something that, you know, a lot of countries have to deal with right now. This one in particular, yeah. uh, the UK as well. Um, you know the disenchantment with elites. Uh, you know this is this is a common pattern. So I think we should as well bring the, the wider context. So I don't think this is very different from. I think, for example, in Spain, the problem, and I always say, it, and I, I know Charles will will look at me again. You know, I think the education in Spain needs to be improved massively. Uh, you know, in a disruptive era of technological revolution, improving the skills of people so that we don't really have 20 or 25 percent of dropouts in schools. That's one of the biggest problems of, 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 of our country. I think, you know, there is where, where, where a lot of effort should go. And by the way, a minority government, you know, this is, this is going to be very common in many places, uh, even in Germany, right? You uh, see, and, in Germany, and it's always been broad coalition, super majority coalition. What, now, now we might even have a minority government in Germany. So I, I think, you know, know, Spain can, you can know? show that for one year we didn't have a government, but the institutions worked. The institutions worked. Uh, there was three percent growth. You know, I think it was shown that you don't really, you know, that you have a robust institutional framework that actually works even without government. Um, on the independence was a bonus point here. Um, it's very difficult for uh, independentists to vote anything other than again a, a nationalist party. Uh, I don't see anyone, even if they are now, they might not go vote. But I think, you know, what you just said, people are in jail, etc. I mean, there is a tribal instinct right now. So I don't see now, you know, a lot of the independents, they will, and they have always done it. So they will, you know, they will continue to vote for nationalist parties. So, I, I, you know, I didn't really expect them to move massively to, you know, now that society is polarized, they stick to their, to their camp. On, on education, my view on education is that it's, it's, it's overdone by both sides. I mean, I, as I said, I was born in Switzerland, I was raised in Switzerland, I was taught, 
you know, maths and geography in Swiss German, not in high German, in Swiss German. Uh, I think the difference is if, if you have people there, I don't, so it, I think it's, it's an asset that you are taught in a different language, right? And I don't think that, you know, Catalans have a problem of speaking Spanish or so, even if they have, you know, you know only four, six hours of Spanish, you know, I mean, I had only four hours of, of high German and I'm fluent in high German. So I think when you're small, you are, you're, you're, you're a sponge. And so having different types of languages that you learn very early on, I think it's very positive. I think what we should be careful is what do you teach, right? I mean, the content, uh, you know, if it is a very radical content that tells people, you know, Catalonia is an independent state in the European Union or that should be an independent state, that again, you know, I mean, you know, one of the, of, of the, of the duties of a, of, a, of a federal state should be to supervise, coordinate, and all of that. And I think that's lacking still in, 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 in Spain. And finally, on what this means for the European Union, of course, I think, you know, there was always this tension between those that have a, had a more intergovernmental approach on, you know, the European Union, and that member states are the key actors in creating the union, and they should not be dismantled or they should not be weakened. And you know there was this, uh, there was you know uh, 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 10, 15 years ago it was stronger. The Europe of, of the regions. Okay, we had even the you know the, the, the Council of the Regions, etc. We see that it is difficult. It is difficult to to undermine the member states, to undermine you know something uh, as as Jaime said that has been there for so many centuries. So following a bit you know kind of perhaps the Chinese example, I go a lot to China, etc. Don't destroy the old. Don't destroy it because if you destroy the old you will get a lot of problems. Okay. So just let it, let it there and build on a more kind of multi-level governments, right? Subsidiarity principle, there are things that need to be decided at the local level, things at the regional level, things at the member state level, and things at the European level, okay? So, so that's, I think, the sui generi kind of uh, uh, model of the European Union. And maybe in time, the, you know, the member states will be eroded if I don't believe in it, but if the members, you know, the European, uh, sorry, the United States of, the Euro uh, of Europe will be created or whatever, or more centralization is happening or more federal structure is happening at the European level. So you will have an erosion of, of, of power at the member states. But I think no one in the European Union is right now in favor of, you know, weakening the member states because the European Union is based on the member states. Other reactions to these questions? <coughs> uh, uh, just about up and Scotland and the European Union. I try to be brief. Um, well, there is a, um, if, you, if people from Catalonia are asked about the referendum, illegal referendum, is sustained opinion that about 80% or more than 80% of people uh, want a referendum of independence, about independence, which means that about half of them are not for independence, but they want a referendum. Okay? I'm not sure I would want a referendum, but I'm not talking about my taste okay, here, okay? So the fact is that a very large majority of people in Catalonia want a referendum. And Scotland is obviously a reference. Remember that the referendum in Scotland was before Brexit, to try to understand, okay? And then it was a referendum agreed with the British government the Prime Minister of Britain went to Edinburgh to sign an agreement with the First Minister of Scotland to have a legal and forcible referendum. The plan for the, I, I spoke to the, to the Scottish Parliament twice. I met the First Minister there a few times. I know a little about it. They have a blueprint, a plan, and the plan was to keep the British crown, the British currency, and to have a transitory period, transition period, to be, uh, with, uh, even if the, the yes for independence won, to remain in the United Kingdom in order to secure that they would be uh, always a member of the European Union, will never be out of it, right? For a couple of years or so, they expected that. It didn't work. But <clears throat> uh, if this kind of referendum would happen in Catalonia, I cannot imagine the Prime Minister of Spain going to Barcelona to sign an agreement with the Catalan president to have this kind of referendum. But let's imagine. I'm pretty sure that the yes would win by landslide. Why so? Because first, Catalonia is high, much more differentiated from Spain than Scotland is from 
Britain, from England. Okay? Is the, the language is alive, uh, the culture, uh, uh, especially the Catalan economy is a net contributor to Spanish finances, and Scotland is subsidized by the, by the British government, right? So it's everything in favor of having more independence, right? For self-interested motivations or for everything, but is, that's a fact. And let me say that, I hope nobody would be offended. At that time, a few years ago, still before Brexit, the alternative was to remain being British or to remain being Spanish, and I think the difference is clear, okay? It's much more appealing. Okay. So that's why I think this referendum will never happen. The Spanish, any Spanish government will never accept such a referendum. The only possibility that I may have in mind, that's another question, is about a hypothetical situation in some future that the European Union was much more powerful, as it happened in the United States. If you remember, the civil war in the United States was about Brexit, kind of exits, right? And it was prevented by the federal government because only at that time the U.S. federal government stopped recognizing the sovereignty of the member states. Right. And at the same time, uh, several uh, redrawing of internal borders were accepted. So, you know, West Virginia split from Virginia, New Hampshire was created, Montana, etc. Several states were created during the Civil War at the same time that they prevented Brexit, uh, exits, I mean. Well, if this ever happened in the European Union, that would be different. That would be, uh, but that would be an opportunity for this kind of redrawing borders or referendums or something like this and preventing new Brexits, which the European Union is very is highly, strongly motivated now to prevent. They are trying to teach Britain a lesson, especially for other countries not to follow the same path, right? Can I just ask, I, on, on referenda, um, you know, there's this, uh, we saw with Brexit, people will vote for kind of a change in the status quo sort of as a, as a protest vote, not really intending it to happen. I recall one kind of particular, one clueless person in the UK sort of saying that she voted as a protest vote. She didn't really want it, but she intended in the next referendum to vote for staying in Brexit. <laughs> and the, the, the interviewer had to say, I'm sorry, that's it, <laughs> you know? And it's 50% plus one, you know, hard Brexit out. So is, uh, in, it's, we un one unpacks the polling data, which is all over the board. I mean, are, are there some people who are voting kind of to express sort of a protest, but it's like we don't really want the consequences, like Miguel, Miguel pointed, pointed out that look what happened to Canada with the flight of investment, et cetera, that they, but, it, but they just want to, you know, express that. Jaime, what do you? I, 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 I would like to, to go to the point of education. <coughs> and um, um, what uh, people doesn't understand is that this, there is a substrate of uh, a very dangerous feeling in Catalonia that is called supremacism. People thinking, and uh, I mean, I am pure Catalan, as I said before, and I have my brothers, sisters, my friends, people thinking always that is better than the Spaniards. Uh, what is, could be true, but uh, the problem is that the Spaniards are uh, also Catalans. Uh, not only in the rest of Spain, but uh, in Catalonia itself. Uh, if you take if you take um, the last names in Catalonia, you will see that um, um, Colomer and Malet, that are pure Catalan last names, are a minority. Uh, and this explains a little bit what has happened um, um, uh, during the last uh, 20, 40 years. It has been a laboratory, a social laboratory, using the Catalan language to brainwashing the population, especially at the education and with, um, with um, 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 newspapers and, and all the media that is either uh, um, uh, state or Catalan owned or uh, um, subsidized by the Catalan government. So it's, it's, um, it's a place where one of the frames that have been created has been uh, we, we, we need to vote. We, we, we need to be Democrats. We, we, we want to decide our future, even if we, are agree, if we agree or not with the independence. But listen, I would like also to vote. I, I live in Barcelona in a very rich uh, neighborhood, and I would like to, I, I, I don't want to contribute to the rest of Barcelona. And, uh, but, but the Barcelona province that is anti-independent uh, perhaps uh, doesn't want to, to stay with, with the rest of, of Catalonia. And, and if you follow this path, 
everybody would we, we, we have the right to 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 to, to split apart uh, i cannot imagine what would happen in any other country in the world where mm, mm, people with uh, taxpayers money um, implement uh, this uh, brainwashing uh, process uh, putting money on 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 on, on uh, and, and so much effort to change the 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 way people has to think uh, on 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 the future but Listen, you, you were talking also about Europe. Europe is an artificial construction. It's an elite's uh, construction. It, uh, it, 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 it started by, by the fear of uh, uh, new worlds. New worlds. It's, it's, um, it's a continent with, with um, different uh, countries, with different histories, with different people that has little in common except the fear of uh, new conflicts. Uh, Catalonia is, is not the same with Spain. We have a common, a common uh, history uh, and, and we share more than, 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 than conflicts and, and war. Um, so very briefly, I, uh, to the education question and then also to, to your question, Robert. Um, there was a very interesting post, it's not my area of expertise, but there was a very interesting post recently in uh, Agenda Pública, which is a an academic blog in 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 Spain, um, published jointly with El Periódico. It's sort of like the monkey cage um, at the Washington Post, and they did a study of um, independence attitudes depending on uh, the period in which you were educated. So, um, younger folks may have been more supportive of independence, but the jump in support for independence happened in, in both in older generations and in younger generations. So it, it can't just be um, the educational system that, that's driving this. Um, and then also, I think your, your question about sort of the authenticity of, of sort of sentiment um, for independence, and this maybe leaves me being able to say something a little bit more optimistic, is in polls, you know, about half the population says that they're sort of in favor of independence, but in a recent poll, they ask, how do you want this whole process to end, this whole, whole um, what's called the process in, in, in Catalonia? And actually the largest group of folks said that they wanted it to end not in independence, but in additional autonomy for Catalonia. So maybe some of those people that express this sentiment of independence are willing to accept an outcome in which it is just more autonomy. And actually very few Catalans think it is going to end in independence. The poll I think was about 16% or something like that thinks that it's actually gonna end in independence. So I think that there is some room, even though I agree with what Joseph said, if you held a referendum, it would it might win. Um, I do think that there is some room in the sentiment in, in Catalonia for some other compromise arrangement, but mm -hmm. I think the the political drivers of this at the level of, of parties and, and party strategies makes that complicated. Great. Well, we're very grateful to uh, Alcano for this partnership and helping us to uh, bring to Washington uh, this distinguished panel to shed light uh, on uh, the ongoing, uh, you know, Catalan crisis and offer a diversity of perspectives. I mean, I think uh, most of us here in Washington are, are who don't follow it are kind of on the on the learning curve uh, to appreciate uh, the importance, uh, the significance of, of, of these developments in Spain and how it resonates with um, things that are occurring, s similar phenomena, you know, uh, uh, across Europe and, and uh, other, other parts of the world. So thank you all for uh, attending. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their excellent presentation.